Hi, my name is Shalom Patel and I'm from Duke University. I'm also a developer for the Internet 2 Grouper project. This is the developers and architects track of the Grouper training. In this video, I'll be talking about how to, how to design groups. Here are the topics that I'll be covering in this part. I'll talk a bit about group and folder structure, then I'll talk about privileges and composite groups, and finally, I'll mention a few ways to integrate Grouper with your applications. Here's a slide that visually demonstrates some of the core Grouper concepts. This was covered in the uh, manager's track, so I'll only briefly mention it again here. So in Grouper, you can have a hierarchy of folders. Within folders, you can have groups. Uh, subjects can be added as members of groups. These subjects are often people, but they can be other types of objects as well. Groups themselves uh, are also considered subjects. You can add one group as a member of another group. Doing this will produce indirect memberships. In Grouper, you can also have composite memberships, and there are three different types. The first type is union, so you can define a group as being a union of two groups. Uh, this is similar to adding both groups as a member of another group. The second type is intersection, so with that you can say that a group is defined as the intersection of two groups. And finally, the third type is complement. Uh, and with that, a group's membership is defined as the members of one group minus the members of another group. This is useful when you want to have exclude lists. I'll talk a bit about an example structure that you may have. Uh, say, for instance, you're a developer in the engineering school at your institution, and you're given access to a folder within the hierarchy called school colon engineering. First off, you may want to create an admin group that would contain all the engineering developers. You may also want to create an apps folder, and within that folder, um, you'd have a folder for each application that you're integrating with Grouper. I'll do a quick demo of this next. Um, so I'm in the Grouper UI right now under the school colon engineering folder. So here, first of all, I can create a folder uh, called Etsy. <coughs> And within there, I can create an admins group. And I can assign myself um, as a member of this group. Now, doing this doesn't give me any privileges to any other groups right now. We'll cover that later on. Uh, but then next, I may want to create an apps folder. And within there, I would create a, a folder for each application. Now I'll give it an appropriate name. I'm just going to call it App 1. Um, and maybe there's an App 2 also. And then within the App 1 folder, for instance, I'll create groups that are specific for this application. Um, so again, I'll give them appropriate names. But for now, I can create a group called Group 1 and a group called Group 2. Next, I'll talk a bit about privileges. Once again, the slide was covered in the manager's track, so I'll be brief here. Folders and groups have privileges associated with them that determine who has access to them. Folders have two types of privileges, one that determines who can create groups within the folder, and one that determines who can create subfolders within the folder. Groups have privileges that determine who could administer the group, which includes being able to delete it, who can update the memberships, who can read the memberships, uh, who can view that the group even exists, and a couple of others. In my example on the previous slide, if you were delegated access to school colon engineering, uh, then you would probably be given both create group and create subfolder privileges. When you create your own folders in the Grouper UI, you're automatically given both of these privileges. And when you create a group in the Grouper UI, you're automatically given the admin privilege to that group. When you create a group, you should consider whether the group is public or not. In Grouper, there's an internal subject called every entity or Grouper all. If privileges are assigned to this subject, then everybody has that privilege. So for example, if you want everybody to be able to read the memberships of your group, then you would give Grouper all view and read privileges. For your hierarchy, you also need to consider how group and folder privileges are maintained when new groups and folders are created. 
A typical best practice is to assign the privileges to groups and then just keep that group's membership list updated. I'll show an example of this. So here I'm back at the app one folder where I have um, two groups, group one and group two. And I want both of these groups to have uh, the same list for the people that have admin access. Um, and that will be based off of the admins group that I created before. So rather than individually specifying the list of people with the admin privilege, I would use the admin group instead. And so here I'm assigning school engineering Etsy admins the admin privilege. Then I can go to group two and do the same thing. And so for, for group two, if I click on show entities with admin privilege, um, <clears throat> It shows the admins group, uh, and since I'm in the admins group, it shows my name in there also. The final point on this slide is that groups and subfolders do not automatically inherit um, privileges based on parent folders. So if three people have access to a folder and you create a group in that folder, you're the only one that's going to have admin privileges to that group by default. But you can also use grouper rules to apply privileges automatically. There are built-in rules in Grouper that allow privileges to be automatically applied to new groups and folders. Now I'll talk a bit about composite memberships. <clears throat> if your Grouper administrator has enabled it, there's a group type called Add, Include, Exclude that allows you to easily manage include and exclude lists. Basically, when you create a new group and assign that group type, it automatically create several other groups. Uh, there would be a system of record group, an include group, and an exclude group. And finally, there would also be an overall group, which would basically be the system of record group plus the include group minus the exclude group. The memberships of the system of record group would be maintained by some source system. <clears throat> you may develop some code that keeps that in sync, or you may ask your grouper administrator to do so as well, for instance, by using the grouper loader. Then you may build an application, for instance, that allows certain people to maintain the include and exclude lists, or they may just <clears throat> simply maintain them using the grouper UI. The overall group is then automatically maintained based off of the other groups. Uh, this may be the final group that determines who has access to some external resource, for instance. There's another group type called require in groups. You can use this to set up a composite that's an intersection of two or more groups. So for example, you may want a final group that's the intersection of a group that's maintained manually and an all staff group that's maintained by the grouper loader or some other automatic way. So if applications use the final group for some entitlement, then when a staff member leaves, he would no longer have access um, to whatever that entitlement is providing. However, if the staff member comes back, he'll automatically be in the final group again because the person's membership in the ad hoc group was not removed automatically. If you want to prevent the person from being in the final group again if he comes back, uh, then instead of using composite, uh, a composite intersection, uh, you would use grouper rules. You can define a rule that says if a person is no longer in the all staff group, then remove the person from another group like the ad hoc group, uh, for instance. So then if the person comes back, he would have to be re-added to the other group. Also, I should mention that the add, include, exclude and the require in groups, group types are mainly for convenience purposes. If they're, not avail if they're not available to you based off of how Grouper is installed at your institution, you can still manually create these composite structures. Now I'll talk just a bit about some ways to integrate Grouper with your applications. Probably the most common and secure method would be by using Grouper Web Services. There are REST-like and SOAP web services. It's obviously language independent, so you can integrate with applications written in all sorts of languages. However, Grouper does come with a web services client in Java, so integration with Java is typically a bit easier. The web services cover most operations in Grouper, and certainly all the common ones are covered, uh, but it doesn't cover them all.
<clears throat> also, from the perspective of your application, it's a lightweight deployment since you don't have to add all of the grouper dependencies into your project. The next approach is using the grouper API. Uh, the API is in Java, so you may have some limitations there. Uh, this does cover all operations, though. If you use the API, your application ends up getting full read and write access to the grouper data, so this is typically not the best approach uh, for, you want, for when you want to integrate grouper with an application. Also, you would have to include all of the grouper jars into your project, so it's not a lightweight deployment like uh, web services. Then there are also a couple of read-only options. Uh, grouper comes with several database views that you can use to query folders, groups, memberships, privileges, and so forth. Also, if your institution is syncing groups to LDAP, you can get the group data from LDAP then. This could be a good option if your application, um, if the application you're working with is already designed uh, to read from LDAP. Also, in many cases, getting groups out of the LDAP will be faster than other approaches, and LDAP is typically easier to make high available. So that's all for this tutorial. Uh, you can click on the quiz link in the video description to reinforce your knowledge of designing groups. And here are some links you can visit for more information. Thanks.